All right, so uh, today we're going to go about 45 minutes um, with our presentation. And that's going to take us through a, a broad overview of Sensu. This is going to be like the 50,000 foot view of Sensu. Um, so hopefully by the end of today, you should understand what Sensu does, the problems that it solves, as well as understand the architecture. Um, and just uh, also go ahead and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to submit those to the Q&A function here on Zoom. All right, so let's start with what Sensu is. Uh, pretty simply, it is a flexible monitoring framework. Uh, so around Sensu, we like to talk about it as a framework, although some other folks have referred to it as a monitoring router. Um, but what do I mean when I say that Sensu is a monitoring framework? Ultimately, what Sensu does is it provides a set of primitives for composing a monitoring system that's going to be tailored to your organizational needs. Um, and we'll go over those primitives today and then over the course of the training session, dig a little bit further into those, uh, those various primitives. So what else does Sensu do? Uh, Sensu does status checks and telemetry at scale. And to clarify a little bit more here, uh, when we say status checks, we're talking about uh, checks that indicate an okay warning or a critical state. Uh, if you are familiar with Nagios or other monitoring systems, you're probably very familiar with this sort of uh, status that's provided by a check. Uh, since you also uh, collects telemetry through metrics checks. Um, and so it's going to return those measurements, um, but it's not going to infer any sort of status to them. Um, you can do with those what you will. Um, and before we get too much further into today's training, um, one thing to clarify is that Sensu is not trying to do it all. Um, rather, it is instead trying to provide the capability to route results and measurements to any number of systems or services. Um, so Sensu is not going to try and be the next InfluxDB. Uh, InfluxDB does time series database really, really well. Um, so rather than re reinvent the wheel, we just simply make sure that Sensu works really well with it. And so Sensu is also designed for dynamic environments. And what do I mean by that? Well, so your clients can register and deregister dynamically. Um, so as you spin clients up uh, or spin them down, they'll be pulled in or pulled out of a Sensu deployment. Um, and there are a couple of different models uh, that support this uh, with Sensu. So this can be either a push model. So this would be a, for example, a check scheduled by the monitoring agent itself, or a pull um, or pub sub uh, model, uh, which means that the check would be scheduled by the server itself. So uh, additionally, checks and results uh, and metrics can be sent by applications without needing to schedule a check. Uh, so you can use things like proxy clients, which we'll get into later, um, or you can have instrumentation inside your application that will send uh, results to a TCP socket that's running on, on a local client um, as, as part of uh, doing any sort of checker metric. So why Sensu? Um, so it allows you to collect metrics and status checks with one system. Um, we're not dealing with separate components. It just deals with one nice uh, little package of a system. Uh, it also interfaces really well with other monitoring checks uh, and monitoring systems. Um, so an example of that, uh, I have a switch here in my home office that I use. Uh, and unfortunately, it won't allow me to run Sensu on it, but it will send SNMP traps. Uh, so with Sensu, you can use uh, your client, uh, if you're using Sensu Enterprise, there's an extension for this. Um, and I will go ahead and drop this in the chat for you guys to go ahead and start taking a look over to. Uh, this is going to be a link to our plugin site. Uh, so you can see exactly what kind of functionality can be added to Sensu um, to make it interface with other monitoring tools. Um, Sensu is also able to act as a sync for stats D metrics, for example, or uh, scrape metrics provided by Prometheus. And I'll drop another link here in the chat for you all. This is uh, an article on our site. Uh, our CTO, Sean, wrote a uh, Prometheus exporter for Sensu. 
So if you're using Sensu in your organization, you're able to use uh, Prometheus and Sensu side by side um, without friction. So in addition to uh, interfacing well with other monitoring tool chains, you can reuse your, your existing plugins, uh, for example. So if you're currently using Nagios, uh, you can use a Nagios check uh, with Sensu. They, they kind of go by the same spec. Um, and uh, if you aren't familiar with Sensu already uh, or haven't had a whole lot of a, uh, an opportunity to play with it, um, I'll be providing a link to a quick demo that you can download and spin up a uh, your own Sensu instance, and you'll see in there that there's actually a, a disk check that you can use and as an example that's done through Nagios. Um, so plugins can also be written in any language. Uh, a lot of our plugins are written in Ruby. Sensu itself is written in Ruby, uh, but that doesn't mean you have to use Ruby. Uh, you can use Golang, you can use Python, uh, you can use any number of languages to, to do a plugin. Sensu also operates uh, with a decoupled model. So what I mean by that is uh, with the various components of Sensu, you can scale them up or down uh, as you need to rather than having to just scale everything up. Um, so the individual components can be scaled pretty seamlessly um, and pretty quickly with, without a whole lot of friction there either. Uh, we also have a great community and I'm going to drop a link in the chat for this as well. If you haven't already uh, joined our Slack channel, uh, by all means, uh, hop into slack.sensu.io. Uh, there's tons of helpful people there, including our staff. Um, and it's, it's a great community to be a part of, especially if you run into any fringe issues that you might not have seen before. Um, usually somebody else has seen it with Sensu. So, uh, a lot of people then ask, well, can I do X with Sensu? Um, and the answer is probably. Uh, so for example, uh, one of our community moderators actually has used Sensu to monitor a kegerator uh, for his team. It's been really interesting to hear this story from him uh, because as it turns out, they started running out of beer in the kegerator and uh, they didn't know why. So when they were monitoring it with Sensu, they noticed that over time, uh, specifically like in the middle of the night, they would see the volume drop. Um, and that happened to coincide with the shift that a janitor was working. Um, and they found out that the janitor was sneaking beer out of the kegerator at night. So if you want to monitor a kegerator, uh, you can do that with Sensu. Uh, you can monitor any number of things, uh, like I mentioned to uh, networking equipment. Um, and it's only going to be easier as we start rolling out Sensu 2.0. So uh, you guys would definitely want to, to subscribe to any newsletters or uh, keep abreast of our, our news as we start to roll out Sensu 2.0. Um, and so let me stop there quick. Are there any questions so far? Um, you can, again, use the Q&A or just hop in chat. Uh, I'm not seeing any, so I'll continue moving on. So Sensu is able to do monitoring at scale. Um, and the way that Sensu does this is known as a, a fan out model or a publish subscribe model. So effectively, this is one and execution. So you may have uh, one execution scheduler, but 50 different clients. And when you run that check, you'll get the result from those 50 different clients. And again, Sensu is very capable of scaling in and out with your infrastructure. Um, and again, clients can dynamically register or deregister uh, via key lives. So Sensu works really well also with dynamic environments. Um, in the age of cloud computing, you guys know as well as I that uh, servers and VMs are short-lived, um, especially when you think about things like containers. So it's very possible that uh, you know you may only have a VM for a few short minutes. Same thing for a container. Sensu is able to monitor those um, and works really well with a variety of infrastructure automation and configuration management, other oper uh, operational tools that kind of bridge those gaps. Um, in addition to all of that, Sensu is able to communicate securely over private and public networks. And we'll get into that in a few slides. 
So at Sensu, we have two different products that we put out. Um, the first being Sensu Core. So when we refer to Core or Sensu Core, we're talking about the open source project. So you guys can download this and use it to your heart's content. Um, and in fact, the demo that uh, I'll send the link out to you later will be using this. Um, Sensu Core is, is MIT licensed. It's written in Ruby. Um, and our first commit to it was in 2011. And we just actually released 1.0 uh, back in September. So we're making strides with, with improving the product and making it something that everybody loves to use. Sensu Enterprise is actually built on top of Sensu Core. Uh, so if you guys have used Sensu in the past, uh, you'll know that for the core version, there's the Sensu server and the Sensu API processes. Uh, what Sensu Enterprise does is it combines those two processes into a, into a seamless JVM process. Um, it does this for uh, some improved performance, and it also includes a number of built-in handlers and filters and mutators, as well as a dashboard that we'll, uh, we'll discuss here shortly um, that's also built on another one of our open source projects. So um, as you guys can see as well, when you get Sensu Enterprise, you, uh, you are essentially paying for the proprietary license and then you get access to me, Edgar, Cameron, and then one of our other colleagues, Anthony. Um, so let's do a brief architecture overview. Um, we'll be going into these individual components a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, but when we talk about a Sensu deployment, uh, this is essentially what it consists of. So we have the transport mechanism, the data store mechanism, the check execution scheduler, the monitoring agent, the event processor, the REST API, and the dashboard. So um, one thing to note is you can run all of these processes on a single server, and they will work great. And in fact, they do work great, uh, as you'll see in, in the demo uh, once I send that out a little bit later. Um, you can also split those individual components out into as many VMs or servers as you need. Um, so let's start by talking about the check execution scheduler and going in a little bit more detail about exactly what that is. The check execution scheduler is a role. So it's not so much a thing as it would be um, just kind of how you decide to handle your checks. So this role can be done on the client, it can be done on the server, or it can be a combination of the two. And for those already familiar with Sensu processes, when we talk about the monitoring agent or the Sensu client, they essentially mean the same thing. So Sensu client is the monitoring agent. And the event processor, this is either going to be Sensu server or Sensu enterprise. Um, and the same thing for the API. Um, so, you remember the previous uh, slide, Sensu Enterprise combines the Sensu server and Sensu API processes into one. Those are the event processor um, in that case. So the first element, uh, arguably the most important element of, uh, of a Sensu deployment is the transport. Um, so this is a messaging oriented architecture that enables you to decouple uh, your various components of a Sensu deployment. Um, this is basically responsible for passaging, excuse me, passing messages between services. So in Sensu, um, your services don't talk directly to one another. They talk to the transport. So the API, the server, the client are all going to talk to this transport element. Um, so it's not like, uh, say I, I would have a server and agent that talk directly to each other. Now, what this does is it reduces the need for service discovery um, since they don't have to talk directly to one, each, uh, one another. So as you guys will see throughout the rest of the presentation, um, you're able to just point a client at the transport, not necessarily the, the server, and it will get registered. You'll start to see checks happen depending on what you have configured. We use RabbitMQ primarily as the transport with Sensu. Uh, the demo does use Redis, 
Um, but RabbitMQ provides a few more things uh, that Redis doesn't. So if you're not familiar with RabbitMQ already, uh, it's provided by Pivotal, and it drives much of Sensu's functionality in terms of pub sub checks or round robin subscriptions. And what we do is we, Sensu's design abstracts away from the transport implementation um, so that you can actually use other things. Uh, so Amazon SQS, for example, you can use that. Um, but really, RabbitMQ is the only transport mechanism that we recommend and we directly support at Sensu. Um, and it has support for TLS with pe uh, peer verification. So, um, you know, in an age where everything's getting hacked, you'll probably want that, uh, that secure communication. Um, so this is fairly trivial uh, to set up. Um, and if you guys want, I can send you a, uh, a GitHub gist that has this uh, as, as part of the demo. Um, RabbitMQ also provides uh, multi-user ACLs, um, and it's able to be clustered. So, you know, if you find that you know one instance of RabbitMQ is not enough, that you want to have something in a high availability configuration, um, you're able to do that with Rabbit as well. Redis uh, is is what we use at Sensu for the data store. Um, so, if you are familiar with Redis, it's put out by Redis Labs. Um, and it's a super quick key value data store. Um, and it's actually the only supported data store. You can use things like AWS Elastic Cache to, to serve in, in place of Redis, uh, but Redis is what we actually provide support for. Um, and as you guys can see, it, it basically serves a, the function of storing the data uh, for Sensu services. And this is just kind of an, uh, a list of the data that's actually being stored uh, inside of Redis. Um, one thing to note here is that Sensu really is not trying to replace any, any sort of system of record. Um, the data that, that's stored in Redis isn't expected to be long lived. So if you want something that's a little bit more durable or uh, persistent in terms of, of check execution, uh, you can use uh, mutators and handlers uh, to basically pipe that data into something like InfluxDB or OpenTSDB, uh, depending on what you have deployed at your organization. So what does Redis store? It stores the current state of things. So this will be clients, incidences, and silences. Um, depending on your environment, if you're spinning up a lot of, of uh, say, EC2 instances or containers, your clients may be registering uh, and deregistering throughout the day um, as, as they're short-lived or as long-lived as, as they are. Um, so for that, we only store the most recent client and check pair. Um, and then with that, we also store the last 21 exit statuses. So this is going to be the zeros, the ones, the twos that are provided by check results. So if you need something longer than those last 21, you'll definitely want to consider using something like Influx. Um, and what that does, those last 21 uh, exit statuses help us determine if a check, excuse me, if a check is, is flapping or not. Um, another thing to, to note here too, uh, most of the data in Redis is, is able to be automatically repopulated. So say for example, uh, an errant admin happens to wipe out your Redis cluster. Um, oops, uh, most of that can be repopulated fairly quickly and fairly easily um, once you get Redis back up and running. Now, the exception to that would be silence entries or proxy clients, um, and we'll, we'll discuss proxy clients uh, more in depth as we go throughout this training cycle. So let's talk about the check execution scheduler. Uh, this is that role that I was mentioning earlier um, that can be done either on the client or the server. And the way that this would work is if you do things on the client, this would be a standalone configuration for a check. Uh, so 
say for example, um, in that demo I'll share later, you might use, uh, you might actually put the check on a client to do that disk check. Um, this would be an example of a standalone check. Um, you would actually actually have to restart the Sensu client in order to get that check to be pulled in. Um, but in this model, the Sensu agent on the client itself is actually going to be doing the check execution and the scheduling. So it'll schedule that check it'll execute that check command, and then it'll send that data over to the transport mechanism. If you decide that a, uh, the, the pub sub model or fan out model is, is better for your particular organization, um, what would be happening is that that disk check, for example, the check would live on the Sensu server itself, and the Sensu server is going to, uh, is going to schedule that, that execution request that will go to the agent. The agent will, same as doing a standalone configuration, go ahead and execute that check command, and then the same as a standalone configuration, that gets sent off to the uh, to the transport. Now, depending on your needs, you may find that a mix of both of those is, is much better fitting for your organization rather than sticking with one or the other. So let's talk about the monitoring agent. When we talk about the monitoring agent, we're talking about the Sensu client process. So this provides a check execution platform um, and provides a means of monitoring local system or external resources. And the whole job here of the agent is to execute those checks and submit the results to the transport. That's its responsibility. Um, so what determines the kind of checks that it might be executing? This, could be the subscription, right? So if we're doing a pub sub model, and I say I have a set of devices that are, are part of the development environment or, or production environment, you can change the check depending on that type of, of environment. Um, and then the client will essentially inherit those checks and then execute them. So the uh, one other thing to mention too about the agent is that it actually provides a, a local TCP socket um, for receiving JSON formatted check results. So this is where you might consider introducing Sensu to say your developers and having them instrument their applications um, and say send that data to the local socket um, and then send that off to Sensu. All right. So we're going to go over the check result life cycle. Um, and I'll have this handy dandy little pointer here. So when I was mentioning the disk check earlier, when, uh, when that check is executed, what's going to happen is that's going to get sent off to the transport, which then is going to get sent to the server, right? So the server is going to consume the check result from the transport queue. And what it does then is it takes that check result and some additional context, for example, the client definition from the data store, and it puts those together and creates an event. Now, what happens after an event is created? Well, it depends on what you or your organization need. So you can send it through a filter to say, if you are getting too much noise um, when it comes to your check, you can filter some of those checks out. Um, you might actually need to put that, that Sensu event through a mutator. So maybe you decide, well, hey, I want to send this off to Graphite, or I want to send this to Influx. Uh, you might have a mutator that takes that, uh, that data, munches it, and then sends it off to Graphite Influx. And then lastly, what happens is that that Sensu event is going to go to a handler. Um, so a handler can be any number of things. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss those a little bit later as far as what sort of handlers you might see in the Sensu ecosystem. So let's talk about the Sensu server. Um, again, so Sensu server, if you are on core, Sensu enterprise, if you're currently using the enterprise product or considering using the enterprise product. So what this does is it maintains the client and incident registries um, and processes check results to create events. And as you guys just saw in the, the life cycle of a, of a Sensu check result, 
Um, it's going to process whatever event is created according to whatever configuration you specified for that check. So um, the event processor in this case is, is ultimately responsible uh, for deciding what to do with that check result um, and then updating that state data in the data store. So this gives you a, a, a more textual representation of what you might do with a filter, mutator, or handler. Uh, so filters, like I mentioned, can improve the signal to noise ratio. Mutators are going to transform or munch that data into something digestible by another application. Uh, and handlers are going to be essentially the way that that data is acted upon. Um, let me take a sec here and just pause quick. Does anybody have any questions so far or is everything pretty clear? I'm not seeing anything. Um, and if I'm talking too quickly, uh, feel free to hop in in the uh, the chat uh, and just say, "Hey, slow down," uh, and I can I'm more than happy to do that. All right. So um, I mentioned earlier that some people like to talk about the event processor as a monitoring router, um, and so it, it may help to think of it this way as well. Um, if you know. It, you're not quite sold on monitoring framework, um, you can think of it as a monitoring router. And what that means is that uh, the event processor's configuration is going to define properties of events that have to match before they're going to be routed to handlers. Uh, so commands are, are executed on clients, those results get queued up for processing, and then those, those results are going to be routed to whatever you need them to be routed to. Um, so for example, I uh, mentioned earlier the the amount of handlers that that you might see in the Sensu ecosystem. This is this is a, a visual representation of just some of them that are available. So, you might have a handler that wakes somebody up in the middle of the night, like Victor Ops or Ops Genie or PagerDuty. Um, you might have a time series database like InfluxDB or OpenTSDB um, that. Uh, data gets sent to. You might actually have, uh, excuse me, uh, a chef or puppet handler that enables your infrastructure to auto scale based on the results that uh, Sensu is receiving. Um, or you could send it off uh, an email message, uh, SMS, or uh, even something like a Slack message or HipChat uh, to, to let people know what's going on. Um, Oh, and I just saw that Yearly uh, said, I'm doing clear enough. Cool. Thank you, Yearly. So, um, I just, I'll actually go back. Um, again, these are this is just a smattering of what's available in the sense of ecosystem. Um, there's a number of things. Uh, if you guys go to the Sensu plugins link that I provided earlier. You might see something that would pique your interest or um, match up with what you're using internally. Um, so feel free to, to browse through those. So let's talk about event processor scaling. Um, we've already hit on that Sensu uses a decoupled model. Um, and what that enables you to do is that if you notice, for example, that uh, one Sensu server is getting bogged down um, with trying to process check results, you can easily add more Sensu servers to that configuration. Same thing goes for Rabbit, same thing goes for Redis, um, but with the event processor, it's going to consume message from the transport in a batch. Um, and so each event that occurs is going to occur on the same, the processing rather, is going to occur on the same uh, event processor instance. Now. Um, one thing to note here is that, um, uh, actually I'm getting a message that looks like we've removed some of our content from Sensu plugins, um, look, but it's actually uh, kind of in transit, just as a side note, um, we're going to be pulling Sensu plugins into uh, a, a broader docs site, um, so you might actually consider using something like uh, our, our plugins uh, page, which I'll drop in the link here. So that URL might actually have more content than what's what's on the Sensu plugin site. 
Um, but okay, so back to the event processor scaling. Um, since Sensu works so well uh, with configuration management, um, it's important that whenever you decide to scale up uh, your your event processor instances, that you use something like uh, configuration management, whether it's uh, Chef, which we have an official Chef cookbook for, uh, Puppet, we have an official Puppet module that you can use, Salt, Ansible, what have you. Um, because once you start getting beyond a single Sensu instance, you're going to want to ensure that, that everything's identical. And in fact, with the, the Sensu event processor, it's crucial that all of your event processors have an identical configuration. So using something like Chef, Salt, Ansible, Puppet is going to reduce the, uh, the error that you're going to see in, in scaling those instances up. All right, so let's talk about the RESTful API that comes with Sensu. Uh, so remember, the Sensu API service uh, it comes with our core product. If you are using Sensu Enterprise, Sensu Server, Sensu API are both going to be bundled into that JVM process. So what does it do? Uh, Sensu's REST API is going to provide a, a pretty friendly and easy to use interface to the state of your monitored infrastructure. So and it's going to be a programmatic, excuse me, a programmatic way to interact with that monitored infrastructure. So you're going to be able to see things like clients, checks, incidents, uh, you know, when, when you issue API requests. It's also a way for you to issue ad hoc check requests uh, or silences. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go ahead and show you guys just some of the endpoints that are available. So you can see there's clients, there's checks, incidences, results, requests, and silenced. That is by no means an exhaustive list of the endpoints um, that are supported by the API. Um, what I might recommend is that you head over to our docs page, which I'll drop in the chat here. Um, and that'll have some reference documentation for you to go over. Uh, you can actually go to the, uh, the API page and see a full list of, of the endpoints there. Now, the API, API excuse me, also provides a way for uh, things like Uchiwa or the Sensu Enterprise dashboard to interact with the infrastructure. So let's cover that. So we provide two dashboards with Sensu. Um, much like Sensu Core and Sensu Enterprise, there is a uh, open source version of our dashboard, which is Uchiwa, and then there's the Sensu Enterprise dashboard. Now, why might you consider using something like Sensu Enterprise? You'll get a few more features than what you might get out of Uchiwa. So for example, you'll get multiple authentication backends. So if your organization is using something like LDAP, OpenID, GitHub, or GitLab, uh, you'll be able to use that as a means of authenticating with the dashboard. Um, so that will give you some RBAC uh, controls that you're able to use there as well. So say you have maybe like a help desk team that is only needing to essentially read the, the values in the, uh, the dashboard, but not take any sort of action, you know, you can set that sort of thing up. Um, and additionally, it provides a central authenticated way of accessing the API endpoints. All right. So any questions so far? Okay. Um, so I realize I'm moving a little bit quicker um, than I probably would have liked to. Uh, so if I'm going too quick, um, or if there's anything you guys want me to, to go back and cover, I'm happy to do that. Just drop a note in the chat. Um, but what we'll do now is we'll we'll just review the Sensu flow of things. Um, so when you deploy Sensu um, and you've got it up and running, what happens first is check execution is scheduled. This is going to be via either uh, if you're doing the the standalone checks, it's going to be executed on excuse me scheduled on the client. Or if you're doing a pub sub model, it's going to be executed on the, uh, or excuse me, scheduled via the server. In both cases, 
the agent itself is actually going to execute that check and run that command. Uh, so in the case of, of the demo, uh, which I will actually go ahead and drop in now for you. In the case of this demo, um, it's going to be a, a disk check, for example. Um, it's going to then get piped to the transport mechanism. Once it's in the transport mechanism, the Sensu server, uh, so again, Sensu Enterprise or the Sensu server process is going to consume that check from the transport. The Sensu server then updates the data store with the state of the, the result. Um, and that's going to get combined with the, the additional uh, information on the client to create an event. After that event is created, what's going to happen is you're, uh, you're going to run that check result through either a series of filters, mutators, or handlers, or some combination of all of those to evaluate and take action on that event. So then in addition to that, the API and the dashboard provide a way for you to read the data from the data store. So hopefully um, that, that gives you a good textual representation. Let's actually cover uh, a more visual represent representation um, so you guys can see what happens. So in this case, you guys can see we have Redis storing the state of, uh, of our client check pairs. We have the server, um, and you can see here there, there are those two boxes, meaning that if you want to run one or a high availability configuration of the server, uh, you're able to do that. Same thing for the API. Here we have RabbitMQ that is providing the transport mechanism, and here we have our clients. So in this case, these two clients here are part of a web server subscription. What happens is, the check http.rb script is run, uh, that gets passed through the transport and then executed on the clients themselves. One is going to provide a warning status, the other is going to provide an okay status. What happens after that is that is then sent back to the server. The server updates the data store, uh, which you can see via the dashboard that's going to be using the API. Um, and one thing you, you actually won't be able to see here is the server acting on that result. So in the case of the warning from the one client here, um, uh, that is going to be, uh, it's going to be acted on by the server. So you may have a series of, of filters, and mutators and handlers that are going to act on the results of that. Um, and Edgar just sent me a note that I, I think I misspoke, I apologize. Um, in both cases, the, the check is, excuse me, the execution request gets sent to RabbitMQ and likewise the results from the web server are going to get sent to RabbitMQ and consumed by the server. Um, so if you guys want to, uh, I believe we have some graphics of this up on our doc site that should hopefully help. Um, but that actually is going to bring us uh, pretty much to the end of the presentation. Um, so We'll just do a quick review. Uh, so hopefully at this point, you understand what Sensu is and the problems that it's going to solve. Um, and hopefully the, the last two slides give you a good idea of the architecture from a high level view and kind of the process uh, that happens inside of a Sensu deployment. So with that said, um, we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just open it up for general Q&A. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section um, and we'll, we'll hang out here for a minute or two to, to answer anything that, that might arise. Right. I'm not seeing any questions pop up, um, but let's see, Cameron might have something to add. Well, I just want to um, thank you, Aaron, for walking us through that. Um, if there were any uh, errors in the material or if it was hard to follow, that's uh, that's on me because I wrote up all this material. So um, like I was saying, uh, 
at the beginning of this session, if you have any feedback uh, about how we can uh, improve the material or the training overall, we, uh, we welcome that. Um, you can email training at sensu.io uh, and we'll, uh, we'll see those any messages sent there. We can um, use that information uh, to, to improve this training. But uh, uh, like Aaron said, we're happy to hang out here and address any questions um, if you want to submit those through the, the Q&A function. Otherwise, uh, next Tuesday, uh, we'll be picking this up again uh, with part two of the introduction. Uh, and uh, Jim has uh, asked uh, what will be covered in part two. It's a great question. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, Sensu's configuration conventions. So how do you write the configuration that's going to drive uh, your, the kind of uh, event handling that we've talked about? We're going to talk about Sensu's monitoring primitives, which are um, checks, filters, mutators, and handlers, uh, which we, we've introduced uh, briefly today. And then we'll talk about how those primitives relate to one another um, so that we can kind of uh, further uh, understand this life cycle of uh, a check result that we've uh, introduced today. Um, it does look like we've got a question too from Igor about uh, Sensu's reliability. So he asks, how reliable is Sensu uh, if some of, let's say, distributed components shut down? Uh, so uh, it depends on your configuration, right? Uh, so if you have a high availability configuration um, for, say, Rabbit or Redis, uh, that should definitely in increase the reliability. Um, you know, obviously, if you're running this on a single host, um, that's going to drastically increase uh, the likelihood that if something goes wrong um, with that one particular host, it's going to infect, or excuse me, affect your entire deployment. Um, so again, in the documentation, we have some great guides that cover doing the whole uh, high availability setup for not only Sensu, but Rabbit, Redis, uh, and, and the like. So um, hopefully that, that helps Igor. The other thing I would add is that um, we try to expose through the Sensu API, the ability for you to monitor the overall health of your Sensu deployment. So you can use um, standard tools, uh, whether that's a separate monitoring system or a, uh, you know, a HTTP monitoring system like Pingdom, for example, is one that I've used in the past. You can configure probes that um, query your Sensu API and they uh, check to make sure that your Sensu servers are connected to the data store and to the transport. And you can also uh, set up um, monitors that will tell you the relative health uh, of your Sensu installation uh, in terms of how many check results are waiting to be processed. So, so there's kind of like the idea of, is my Sensu system up and running? And is my Sensu system processing these check results as quickly as I think it should be? And so those are two aspects of the system health that we expose through the API. Uh, and you can, you can use uh, existing tools like Pingdom or, um, you know, for example, uh, you could have a, a two Nagios, I'm sorry, two Sensu systems that um, monitor one another uh, by checking on each other's APIs uh, and then alerting when the other goes down. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can um, monitor the overall health. And uh, like Aaron said, um, you can also uh, deploy uh, parts of the architecture and uh, high availability scenarios that uh, reduce the chance that you're going to have a, a single point of failure in your architecture. Um, and just quickly, I just dropped in the link uh, for registering for upcoming training. So if you guys haven't actually uh, had the chance to register for any additional uh, sessions, uh, go ahead and click that link and you're able to go there. So, I think that brings us to the end of the time. If, uh, if you guys have any additional questions, again, like Cameron mentioned, just shoot them over to training at sensu.io uh, and we'll answer them there. All right, thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll hope to see you next time.